All right, so let's get, let's get going. Um, welcome to our session. This session is about uh, scaling up in industrial IoT implementations, and we thank you for being here. My name is Catalin Vieiro. I'm an architect specialized in IoT, and I have with me uh, Neil Sendas and Russ Pardinsky. And we will go uh, through a few slides, and we will showcase how uh, Woodside Energy actually has managed to scale up in a way that uh, is, uh, is best practice. So let's get going uh, with some related breakouts. Uh, these are, these are um, breakouts that you may want to attend because they're related to this particular, particular one. So it's something that I think we think it's, uh, it's going to be beneficial. Uh, here is the agenda for today. So the agenda includes a very brief overview as to what makes industrial IoT challenging. And many times, you know, when we hear about industrial IoT, we hear that it's very difficult. And we'll talk a little bit about why we see that in our day-to-day -day, uh, conversations with industrial partners. We will then invite Russ to uh, go over some of the key takeaways from what they have learned when they implemented industrial IoT at Woodside Energy. Uh, we'll go over a desire state for industrial IoT architecture. We will go over how to build that from the ground up. And then we will transition into how to actually implement that um, architecture at scale. And we'll begin with a single um, uh, industrial IoT device, and we'll move on to the scaling portion. So what makes industrial IoT challenging, right? Well, we know it's insular. And it's insular because uh, equipment manufacturers usually design parts to fulfill particular functions within the factory. And this actually creates equipment that actually does not talk to anything else. So they're very good at what they do, but they, they don't talk across the, the spectrum of equipment within a factory. So many times uh, I go meet with uh, executives or engineers at industrial facilities, and one of the first uh, questions that I get asked is, why is this machine performing better in this particular location than some other location? And nobody has a clue. I mean, they sort of speculate, they think they know, they have an idea about it, but they don't know for a fact. Uh, so now, we, even within the same facility, you're going to think about, how do I stitch the industrial IoT data together in a way that makes sense for the production line? And uh, right now, it's actually very difficult. And you hear about implementations that use different uh, industrial connectors or protocols, like Modbus, OPC Uway, uh, CAN bus. You hear a lot about that, but you don't know actually how to put them all together in a way that makes sense. So because of that, it's actually difficult to optimize the operations. Right, you have, you have the ability to, to figure out if the machine works well or not, but you don't know how to optimize the operation. The second piece that actually makes industrial IT challenging, uh, you guys know what that is? <laughs> Cassette tape. Some of you don't know. I wanted to put a rotary phone, but it wasn't connected. <laughs> but, so the cassette tape, uh, in this case, you know, we have a lot of heterogeneous solutions. So uh, is the fact that the factory as different manufacturers, as different pieces of equipment, as different types of protocols. So how are we going to be able to bring them up to life, right? To make sure that one piece of machinery can talk to another piece of machinery. And furthermore, how can that piece of machinery actually talk to the control systems? In addition, you have proprietary integrations, right? If you, if you work with GE, if you work with Siemens, if you work with a variety of industrial providers, you will find out that every single one of them wants to hold on to their data. And obviously, since they hold on to their data, they will share as little data as they can. And because of that, you have very specialized know-how, right? If a piece of machinery breaks, you're going to just call a particular service company to take care of the piece of machinery. There is no knowledge that actually can be learned from the collective of the factory. And the third piece, which is actually very, very interesting, is the culture. There is a culture at industrial uh, facilities that, uh, and we see this frequently. We see this frequently with, with industrial implementations that say, I want to share no data with the cloud. This is something that we hear very, very frequently. And because of that, the culture is actually focused on individual pieces of machinery. 
So they know um, if, you, if you manage uh, an industrial IT operation, you know which piece of equipment is actually critical to the operation. You're going to focus your energy in actually making sure that the piece of equipment functions well. But you'll not actually be able to create an ecosystem where every machine is treated equally. And this, to, up to a point, makes sense. So, so how do I uh, sort of embrace new paradigm with this idea that I have a cultural component behind the scenes? And uh, uh, Russ is going to actually walk us through how um, Woodside Energy managed to, uh, to, to embrace a culture that, that created a, 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 new, a new sort of company out of uh, nothing. So I'm going to invite Russ to, to, the, to the stage to talk about his, his perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, who here actually saw Vogel's keynote speech this morning? A couple of you. So during that, he sort of uh, profiled uh, Woodside. But for those of you that didn't get to see that, um, I'll just go through a little bit about what we do. Um, up on the screen there, you see this is one of six uh, of our LNG facilities. So basically, that's methane that comes out of your stove, right, your gas. We cool it down to minus 160 degrees Celsius, turns into a liquid. We can ship it around the world, keep the lights on in Tokyo, that sort of thing. Um, these are very large facilities, about a couple of kilometers by uh, two square kilometers, uh, sorry, two kilometers by two kilometers, and we've got uh, a, basically a fully automated offshore natural gas platform that pipes gas to this. There's nobody on board that platform. Um, these things are pretty complex. We use advanced process control to, to run these things, um, and the, they're very, very costly to build. Um, you're not going to get this facility you see right here. We didn't get much change from $15 billion. So how do you actually uh, transform some of these things uh, into uh, more of into the digital realm? So I'll walk that through. So this is basically what we call our, our, our fuse platform. Uh, this is a combination of uh, our existing plant data. So all these wired sensors are incorporated into here. Um, and all of our IoT sensors are incorporated into here as well. So basically what you're seeing here is we can go and walk around the virtual plant, um, take a look at images, see if, if there's any even equipment's been delivered yet. Um, yes, there we go, that's been done. Um, go backwards, forwards in time, and really see, uh, get a good sense of what the uh, facility is, is uh, experiencing and what's going on right now. So really the objective of the team here is something that we uh, set for ourselves and we call this better than human awareness. Now what does that mean? That means that we want an operator, an engineer, a maintenance technician to actually have more information if they were standing in front of this digital asset than if they would have actually um, if they were standing right there in front of it. You can see a lot of different IoT devices coming up. Um, some of them are, are camera boxes that take images uh, every six minutes, or sorry, every six hours of the facility. Um, we can then uh, exercise some machine learning on simple things like oil sight glasses. Right? And rather than have somebody walk a kilometer and a half to go look and see if there's enough oil in the pump, actually the, the, we now have a camera looking at that and actually just doing some edge analytics and saying, well, that oil level's at 87%. Lots of value in terms of that. We're creating digital records that then now we can use to enhance our um, condition-based monitoring um, and uh, uh, LNG plant optimization. So what you're seeing here is obviously uh, the, the 3D uh, placement of data. As well, we can hear how the pumps are going. Right? So this is operator craft. Yep, that's sounding pretty good. It's not cavalcating or anything. So we can sense just about anything that we want to sense. Um, in this, we can uh, link all of the engineering, the process data, um, the, maybe even the operator's manuals from the uh, equipment manufacturers. So really putting all of this data into one place. And then also using some uh, very modern uh, reality capture technology so that we can actually see what the actual state of the facility is there. So this is a 2.2 billion, uh, roughly 2 billion um, point cloud, colorized point cloud um, that we shot using survey grade uh, LIDAR systems. And this actually really increases the operator's awareness of the facility. Um, they can actually, we can schedule these things. You can imagine one of these things on the back of a robotic platform. And every so often we can actually update this, do analytics actually on the point cloud, see what's changed on that. Um, this is a cyclone uh, area, so if a cyclone comes over, we can actually just send, get a new scan. Um, is there anything that uh, was got knocked down or that we need to replace? Um, one of the nice things about these digital platforms that you see right here um, is 
when the shift handover begins and I join my shift and it's now my turn to, to walk around the facility and just see how the facility is producing, we can use the, the, the digital twin that you see here um, actually to take you to each task that you have and actually show you what you need to, to see um, in that particular task. So what you're seeing uh, in the demo right now is these are linked to the operator tasks. We can go through an individual one. We can say, yes, what is the task that needs to be done? Yep, I can see from that camera or I can see from that vibration or temperature sensor that it's in, uh, operating normally, and I just click complete the task. Or I can put a little note there, huh, this is something a little bit strange. We will need to keep an eye on this. So I guess then what is the overall sort of point of all this? I think the point of this is really can we actually operate more and more complex equipment remotely? Can we actually turn smart or dumb pieces of equipment that aren't censored, maybe they're legacy equipment that you mentioned, can we turn them into to smart pieces of equipment? And the answer is yes, we've, we've already done that. I think the implications are a little bit bigger. Um, so you can imagine that this facility right now is about 1,600 kilometers north of Perth, Western Australia. So that's about a 30-hour plane ride to get to. And once you get there, actually, it's another three-hour plane ride there. And then actually, once you're there, if you want to go offshore, it's a couple of hours in a helicopter. You know, and going in that helicopter, one trip doesn't get much uh, change back from about $30,000. So if we can operate these things remotely, massive uh, savings in cost, um, massive savings actually to the environmental footprint of all that, of, of all that travel, um, and we actually get a huge amount of uh, efficiency throughout our operations. One of the other things that I think I really uh, I do like about the implications of this is how that culturally changes the workforce, right? If you are a returning parent, maybe from maternity leave and you're just coming back, well, flying offshore for two weeks, flying back for two weeks, that's not really an option for you, but it is now. Or if you have mobility concerns, right? You might not be able to actually have a job walking around these facilities, going up and down all these stairs, but with this technology, now you can. So it really opens up uh, opportunities to the broader workforce. So if you see that kind of why we go down this vision, why well, we take a run at it, seeing some nodding heads. All right, so let's move from the dreamer stage to the actually builder stage. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, um, we went to some of the uh, normal equipment manufacturers that you would expect in any industrial setting and said, hey, can we have some IoT sensors? We want some smart sensors. We want to turn our legacy equipment into smart equipment. Absolutely. Boy, oh boy, were they happy to quote us. You know, thousands of dollars per sensor. I'm like, I don't see how that scales. Um, so we're an energy company, and suddenly now we're actually manufacturing wireless IoT devices. Who knew? Sure. Um, so on the one that you see there on the left, the IoT, there's an IoT camera box. Um, so that one actually can take pictures every about six hours. It wakes itself up, takes a picture, picture, sends that into the cloud, um, shuts itself down again. So we've got some good battery life. Um, the, actually, the latest iteration that's just being installed right now actually has a small um, photovoltaic cell. So actually, we can almost get continuous video from one of those things. Um, the one there on the right, the orange one, uh, that's... Um, one of our vibra temps, vibra temp, vibration and temperature. So basically, they're like USB-Cs. You can plug them into the back. Um, and right there uh, on the screen is a vibration sensor. We can put that right where we want to on the motor or the pump uh, and then get uh, live vibration data on that. Um, each of these cost a couple hundred bucks each, right? They're explosion-proof, sort of EX-rated, so they can exist in a methane or a coal dust atmosphere, whatever that is, and not cause an explosion. And all of these sort of um, are uh, connected back to AWS IoT Core. So let's, now that we've got uh, the sensors there, uh, we actually have to start um, getting the data ingested. So how do we do that? So on our LNG plants, we actually have, again, about 200,000 uh, fixed sensors, and now actually multiple hundreds of IoT sensors, more every two weeks. And what we do is we put them through a gateway, uh, the Holy Trinity, LTE, Wi-Fi, or LoRa. Um, we'll then go through. Then we're using IoT Greengrass on site uh, for a couple of different reasons. First of all, we can do the edge processing there. So we don't have to maybe transmit images back. We can actually uh, do the analytics on the image and actually transmit just the result of that analytics uh, back. Um, kind of what you get out of the box for IoT Greengrass is you also get uh, data queuing. These are, remote, uh, these are remote facilities. Sometimes the networking does go down, and so we don't want to lose that data. So we'll just actually store that, and then bang, when we actually relink to the IoT core, it can get retransmitted and nothing is lost. Um, once it's actually in IoT core, then all of the normal things you would expect, 
Um, we've got S3 to store all the information. Uh, we use uh, both Elasticsearch and IoT Analytics on that. And I'll talk a little bit more um, uh, about IoT events, um, which we are actually using to monitor uh, the health of our digital uh, asset. So what are some of the key lessons that we learned is get out of your lab as soon as possible. It's a great, it's a safe environment, stable networks, all that sort of good stuff. Um, but if you don't get to the field um, and actually start on your pilot program on live working equipment, you're not going to learn as fast. Um, we're up there every, every two weeks. Um, so it's really interesting. It's a unique experience for our uh, software developers. They'll be uh, spending sort of every two weeks. It might be uh, eight days on the code. And then the last two days, they'll be wearing high vis. They've got their own permit to work. They can, they can hold, they don't need to be hands held by the operation staff, and they can go install sensors and iterate like that. The benefits we get from doing that is, of course, we become one with the operation staff. They actually point out, hey, can you help me out with some, uh, you know, maybe it's a specific problem they're having on the day, or maybe it's like, wow, if you can do that, could you actually do this as well? And actually, that's getting really, really good. In fact, um, my current head of robotics, uh, Sean Fernando, actually was an, uh, an operations manager in an offshore facility before rotating into my team, and he'll rotate out uh, next year. Um, the device monitoring. So if you uh, get this done and it's actually working, the pilot program and the operations staff are now bought in, you actually have to take your job then as seriously as they, they take theirs. So it is their job to actually run that facility as most efficiently, maintain it so it doesn't break, there's no hazards, all of that stuff. That's their job, and they do it very, very well. So we have to take our job on maintaining this new digital asset the same. And you can't actually maintain a digital asset if you don't know what's going on in that. So device monitoring uh, is a critical, important thing. It might not be as wow and snazzy as some of the 3D visualization and the 3D um, localization of our data that you see there. But it actually, if you don't have it, um, you're not going to get very far at all. So how do you do that? So set up a monitoring architecture. Um, so again, the data has went into the IoT core. We then actually take it to Kinesis. Um, and what do we do when it hits Kinesis? Actually, we enrich the data. So if you think it's not just a time series of, let's say, this is a temperature as we go through time, right? we actually have more information that is actually quite useful to monitoring the health of this digital asset. And that, for example, that could be like the Wi-Fi. What node, is you, what node are you hooked up to? Um, have you changed nodes for whatever reason from our mesh network um, up on site? What's the Wi-Fi strength? All of that sort of stuff. We can enrich that, uh, enrich that data. Then we can actually uh, push that through. Uh, we've obviously got CloudWatch, so we can monitor what's going on in terms of the connectivity and things. Um, but then each individual device, we actually push to IoT events. Um, and we uh, can use that then to flag with our teams in Perth what sort of uh, IoT assets might be uh, in trouble and maybe we have to go change out or check. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about our, the dashboards that we have and how we integrate then with the WebEx teams and why. So let's go to IoT events. Um, IoT events was at, uh, announced actually at this, this event last year. Um, so we're a big user of uh, sort of day one um, and often day one minus, um, things that AWS comes out. And what does this do? This allows you to actually scale your, your monitoring of the health of your digital asset. So as you see, it's a nice graphical interface, and actually it just is really quite easy to scale um, for all of your different sensor types. You say, OK, well, I woke up, and I was expecting this sensor to send me a, an image um, every six hours. It's six and a half hours. You know what? I'm just going to watch you a little bit closer, because you actually haven't checked in yet. Uh, but I'm not going to worry. You know, these are $200 sensors, and Wi-Fi could be down up there. Who knows? Um, and it, so that'll just transition to our warning states. But then actually, we can move that on. And if it misses a second one, well, you're, you're definitely offline. And then we can actually prioritize replacing that sensor, going up, or figuring out um, what we have to do. And there's a couple of real examples on this when we, uh, when we actually went from our temporary or proof of concept sort of Wi-Fi uh, network to our more of our, our mesh network. So once you have this, um, how do you actually make it really, really easy for your teams um, to, to work with? We use WebEx Teams uh, just naturally within us and not just in the monitoring, but all, uh, all aspects of sort of our business. And so we just actually have nice little software bots that the actual monitoring teams can actually use. So they can talk back and forth and those things, or they can actually say, hey, uh, how is our, all of our devices going? Anything come down in the next hour or the last hour or so? And then they can go right down the rabbit hole and get that information um, as they want. That makes sense why we'd want to do that? Yeah. 
And then so that it really allows uh, the, the, the work to actually get done and embed um, the health monitoring of your digital asset in, in the ways of, that you currently work anyway. Um, obviously, we've got our dashboards. These are Kvanda uh, gas, uh, dashboards. You can see the power cycling. Um, this was uh, er, early, earlier. Um, we have, uh, you can see the camera states uh, for our camera networks there. Uh, a lot of them are offline. Um, this is when we were just setting it up and, and turning them all back on. But you can really actually see um, the health of the network here. So I guess then the takeaways is, you know, real life is very, very different than the lab. Um, we actually had, when we switched over to our permanent Wi-Fi networks up on site, there were much more of a mesh networks um, than the individual node that we had there just for testing. We found that actually a lot of the software on chips and on the cameras um, actually didn't cope with that very, very well. So thankfully, um, we had prioritized over-the-air updates um, ahead of some features, and so we were able to patch that very quickly. Um, the IoT um, tools that you have right now at AWS, um, the tooling has improved uh, dramatically. Um, I get asked, it's like, well, we tried this whole IoT at scale thing a couple of years ago, and we just couldn't make it work. Um, the advice I would give, if that is the case for your organization, give it another try. Um, because the tooling and how easy these things are ha uh, to implement has really, really advanced, um, even over the past six to 12 months. So definitely give it another um, go and of course the event-based architecture that just dr dramatically um, drops the workload of your of your very precious sort of digital teams that you really you want to actually um, optimize their time. All right. When with that, I will hand it back to my good friend Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, what what I wanted you to sort of take away from this uh, from Russ's sort of story, right, is that there is a lot of data that comes out of uh, IoT devices. The second piece is actually related to the cultural shift. How do you manage to accomplish a cultural shift at the scale? And the third piece actually relates to having a vision in mind. What, are, what is the final objective? And we've seen what, uh, what uh, could be achieved with having uh, a clear architecture in mind. We saw the final architecture. The architecture was built to achieve the objectives, the business objectives outlined. But many, in many cases, uh, and I'm going to walk you through a future state architecture for a real case enterprise that I've worked with. And in this case, they do conveyor belt condition monitoring. So think about a facility that has maybe 200 conveyor belts that transport uh, different sort of mineral content from the mine site to the storage place. So now it's critical that the, the conveyor belts be monitored constantly because if they, they break, uh, then they have to stop and they have to literally stitch the whole thing together or replace it. And this could cost maybe $2 million a year if this happens uh, randomly. So they were after uh, predicting uh, when a conveyor belt might fail. So the, the entire architecture that I'm going to unveil now actually begins with the factory site, which is actually the place where they do the transportation, and then we have the AWS components on, on the right-hand side. The users uh, will need to access the data via a website or an app, and I, uh, I'm showing you two conveyor belts in this case, and attached to the conveyor belts, there are two cameras, and the cameras are actually together with an NVIDIA Jetson TX2 gateway, the, the, the gateway itself has uh, green, grass, green grass, AWS IoT green grass installed on it. And in case you didn't know, uh, green grass gives uh, quite a few of capabilities at the edge. It inherits quite a bit of functionality from the cloud. For instance, I can have a message broker at the edge. Uh, I can actually ensure the security between the devices, in this case, the camera and the cloud. I can execute Lambda function at the edge. Uh, in, in this case, we have an OPC UA adapter that collects information from the engines, from the electrical engines that power the belt. Uh, so we get the vibration data, we get the, the power used by the engines, and we get actually the, the, um, the noise that the, engine, uh, the engines are making. So those three pieces, plus the video capture, uh, are used to actually develop machine learning model to predict when the conveyor belt is going to break. And the um, machine learning models are then deployed. There is a single model actually deployed back to the Greengrass software via the console and then, or via the CLI, 
and now I can do the prediction directly at the edge. The OPC UA adapter is used to collect data from a, from a OPC uh, bus that actually uh, sends the data to a Lambda function on the, onto the green grass. So, so on, on the cloud side, right, we have the standard AWS IoT core components, we have the rule engine, we have the topics, we have the action. And the action, in this case, the data gets sent to an S3 bucket, the video gets deposited into S3 buckets frame by frame, and uh, then I have to develop the IoT green grass components uh, and then uh, package them up and send them as a group back to the, to the edge. And they have the same components we talked about. And now what services did we use on the, on the back side, on the cloud side? We used quite a bit of Lambda functions, right? The Lambda functions are actually being written to take advantage of the machine learning inference at the edge. We used uh, the Amazon S3 to store the data. The data gets stored uh, literally very quickly. We store some data in Amazon uh, DynamoDB because the, there is a web app actually being uh, developed with, uh, on AWS uh, Beanstalk. So this is the app, that's the web app that actually users get to interact with the data that is being extracted. And obviously we, we use the SageMaker to, to develop the, the, uh, the machine learning model. So how do we get to that stage? So I wanted to showcase that perspective because this is the objective, our objective. How do we get to that point? So the, the whole conversation is about it's very easy to get started with IoT, right? It's actually really, really easy. You can do this at your house. Anybody can do that. One of the biggest challenges with IoT is actually scaling up. And uh, so usually when we begin an IoT project, we begin it with a single, single device or maybe five devices. And we have a clear business objective in mind. And we mentioned that the clear business objectives could be the monitoring of the assets scattered of, over, over a large area, right? Another set of objectives could be, hey, tell me when do you think this belt might fail, right? So what kind of data do I need to get for that? So as soon as we identify the business objectives, we need to settle on pieces of hardware that can fulfill that function. So in this case, I need to have a camera, I need to have sensors, and I need them to be attached to some compute at the edge. We talked about the fact that we use an NVIDIA uh, Jetson TX2, but there are many choices available. Uh, it depends, you can pay between $200 and $1,200 maybe, depending on all sorts of factors. Uh, and now you have to consider the provisioning. How do you do the provisioning at scale, right? If you provision a single device, it's actually very easy. But then how do you think about provisioning the device uh, multiple times? And you need to provide the security credential. You need to provide its identity in the cloud. You need to provide the data pipeline and the control pipeline. So when you think about that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you want to get the data that you, you need to, to fulfill the business objective. Uh, as soon as you do that, right, I would not say you should iterate too much over this, because even if you start with a single sensor, like vibration data and the noise, this could be sufficient. It's not going to be very accurate, but it's going to be sufficient to get it started. So don't focus on collecting all the data from the beginning. It's very easy to, to make adjustments later on. So uh, Russ showed showed us how they used out-of-the-box services, right, native AWS capabilities to scale up. Now we're going to take a different slant and we're going to say, how can we, as developers, begin to think about uh, scalability from a coding perspective up? And for that, uh, we recommend uh, you take a look at AWS Cloud Development Kit. Have you guys looked at it ever? Have you heard about it? Uh, Take a look at it because it's actually a very powerful tool. It's, it's actually a framework that abstracts the creation of cloud formations away from the JSON and YAML files, right? So you don't have to write JSON code or whatever, you know, uh, JSON documents. You're just going to write code like a developer, and the output of the code is going to be a cloud formation template. So the structure, actually you have also a lot of choices in terms of which programming languages you can use. So if you, if you like Java, you can continue to use Java. If you like JavaScript, you can use JavaScript. You can use TypeScript, which is an open source sort of super Java uh, script. You have uh, also access to C Sharp. Whichever code you, you like to work with, that's the one you can use. What you need to keep in mind though is that uh, you need to think about the the uh, CDK is having the ability to, to, to create 
uh, a stack. So it's called a stack because the CloudFormation template is going to create all resources for you when it's being deployed. And we'll show you how that actually works out in reality. So in this case, in our example, we're going to have a stack that includes two constructs. One of them is a, a Lambda function. We showed in the architecture that the Lambda function resides on the green grass. And then we're going to have the, the green grass core itself that needs to be provisioned which means that it needs to have security, it needs to have an identity, and it needs to have access to topics. So let's see how do we do that. Uh, and we talked about the fact that the output is going to be a CloudFormation template, which gets executed against the account with which you have actually deployed the CDK on. So um, I suggest that you do this on development, on a development account first, see how that works out, and then move it to production. So here are the, the very simple steps to install the CDK on your laptop or your Cloud9 environment or EC2 environment. And you know, you just do a simple installation. In my case, I use the TypeScript. So I specifically called out in yellow that I'm going to use TypeScript to develop my, my stack. So the rest of the things are resources that are being used by the CDK to actually be able to deploy uh, the, cloud, the cloud formation. And here is a function, right? That, uh, it's a script that uh, is actually written in TypeScript uh, that is going to uh, actually create uh, our, uh, our resources. So in this case, I define a constructor, and I'm going to make sure that I, I, I access the right stack. I take advantage of the AWS CDK core as well as the Lambda. So we have two things that we need to take care of. And then when we move on, here is how we create a Lambda function on the CDK. Uh, so the Lambda function, I'm going to tell it, you know, uh, what is the location, what sort of language I'm going to use to, to understand the, the, the function, and where the code resides on my laptop, right? And then after I do this, uh, I need to provide, to give it an alias, and off I go. So in this case, I'm going to have two components. One is going to be a Lambda function, and one is going to be my green grass uh, core and I'm going to reference them. You see that path with the dot, dot lib is actually on my laptop. Uh, and then when you, when you deploy it, it just needs to, to pass the ID, which is generated by the new application that you're developing, and off you go. Uh, and to deploy it, it's actually a very, very straightforward process, and all of a sudden, you have a CloudFormation template that's being generated for you. And um, you need to bootstrap it, build it, and deploy it, and off you go. And you should see a message similar to this uh, from an app perspective, from your own laptop perspective. And I'm going to actually now call out on Neil, uh, who's going to actually show us a demo of the code we just went over, because I think it's, in, it's, it's going to be very useful for you to get an idea and a perspective as to how to develop your applications from the code app to meet the strategy in the center. So um, as Russ mentioned earlier, we have been continuously improving on our tool set. So I want to show you two tools that we have. One is uh, a device tester and CDK. So let's talk about device tester first. Device tester is a test automation suite for your green grass application. So when you uh, start the journey of deploying green grass devices across your device fleets, um, you want to make sure that those devices can support all the green grass components before you even, even start the deployment process. And uh, device tester is a tool that helps you automate that test process. This is a very simple tool. It, uh, it is an executable you download. You can put it on your laptop and then connect to all your device fleets remotely and then um, what Device Tester does is it downloads Greengrass binaries on it, runs all the tests, makes sure that you can um, support all the requ required components, and then uh, sends you a report. So I'm going to uh, show you a demo of the tool. Go to the demo screen. OK, there you go. So I'll make sure I have so this is your device tester. So you downloaded the binaries. It's an executable, and it comes with a set of configuration files. 
Very easy configurations. You first specify which region your devices are in. You provide um, the, the region. You provide certificates if you are connecting to those devices using a certificate. Uh, provide where you have the, the configurations for your devices and credentials. In this case, I'm using my uh, default credentials. And in the device file is where you configure your device fleet. So there's a concept of pools. You can have multiple pools, and you can have multiple devices inside a pool, as long as all these devices have the same SKU. What I mean by that is, let's say, you have a set of uh, Raspberry Pis. All of these are part of the same SKU. So you create a device pool and specify how do you want to connect to that device. In this case, I uh, provide the IP addresses and credentials. You could have multiple devices in this pool. And you could have multiple pools based on how many uh, devices you have, set of devices you have. So once you configure all this, you go to the executable binary and run those uh, test suites. So before that, I want to show you the test suite itself. So this is a test suite, and it has a set of test groups. So it tests all the different components that you need to make sure they're, they're supported before even you go ahead with purchasing all these devices in, in bulk. So it does make sure that you could, you, it supports all the container binaries, you can deploy a Lambda function on these devices, whether you can run those uh, Lambda functions in a container or not. Does it support the green grass dependencies? Can you integrate with HSM if you want to? MQTT, can it support MQTT? Can you connect over MQTT to IoT core? Over the air updates, resources, a uh, set of um, um, hardware that we support, and the version. So it, when you run these tests, it goes through all of these components. It's make sure that you can um, you support all of these. You could run all of this together, or you could test one particular test group at a time. So in this case, I'm going to run one particular test group, which is deployment. So you run, uh, type run suite, group ID, and deployment. And it would start the deployment process. What it will do is download the green grass binary onto the device that I connected. You remember, remember you saw the IP address. It remotely connects to that device, downloads green grass binaries, deploys it, provisions it, and, and it'll generate a report for me. So here we see it's test, running the test cases, provisioning the green grass, extracting the binaries. It's extracted, finishing provisioning, and all that. So it continues while it goes. Um, I have a test report. Uh, just to show you how the test report looks like. When you run those reports, it'll generate a J unit report that shows what is the output of these tests. So this is your test report, and uh, it goes through all these features, test this green grass dependencies, tested, successfully completed testing, tests MQTT communications on green grass, tested over the air updates. And if you had any errors, it will come up here as well. So once you have this report, um, you could, if you, you can make sure that your device is certified and can support green grass. This process is also very important for our APN partners who'd like to certify that their devices can support IoT green grass. So there is a certification process where you have to run support certain checks. You could use this device tester to run those test cases, and there is a self-help self process where you can upload the test report, and once um, all those tests are successful, you can mark that your device is green grass, green grass compatible. So that process uh, improves um, the APN's um, certification process a lot. So here, see this... Uh, test is still going on, but eventually when it completes, it'll tell you that, you know, how many tests were successful, how many uh, passed, and how many failed, and then you can go back and uh, make some changes if you need to. So this is a device tester. 
Uh, let's quickly go through CDK. Um, if you are from a development background, if you are from Java background, you'll appreciate programming in TypeScript and Java than writing your own JSON, JSON uh, file. So uh, this is the, uh, the Greengrass um, file. This is a stack. You, um, what you do is it's a type, TypeScript stack where you import the Greengrass binaries, uh, the, the libraries, and then create your classes, Greengrass class. So as you can see here, you create all the different components that you need to set up Greengrass, the IoT um, core, the, the IoT um, uh, the certificates and the policies, the, the Greengrass core. So here, as you see, you're creating a thing using new IoT configurations thing. Um, then you create the IoT policies, attach your certificate to the policy, policy to the certificate, create your Greengrass core, and then create your Lambda. All of this using TypeScript. This is your Lambda function, and you specify what is the Lambda function handler. And when you're ready to deploy this, you're going to call the deploy function. And this will, in turn, create the CloudFormation script for you and deploy it as well. So let's get started here. It'll take a while. Um, since I already have a component already, so it's asking me, do you want me to overwrite it? So while it creates all these components, I've already run this script before. So this is how the CloudFormation script looks like once you have created it. So if you have used CloudFormation, you know these are resources. Uh, you start with the, the thing itself, the policy, the principle, the thing principle, core definition, you're defining the green grass core, and then the dependencies, as in you have to make sure that things exist before the code's created, resources and all that. So this is all done by CDK. And uh, similarly, the Lambda function, it creates a Lambda function for you with all the handlers. This is a sample handler. And so one thing I wanted to highlight is, you see, when you look at the, the CDK code for Lambda, you see how many, there are 25 lines of TypeScript code. This generated a cloud formation script of 150 lines. So when you are deploying Greengrass in bulk, when you're creating and provisioning your Greengrass resources in bulk, this is going to save a lot of provisioning time. And that's the benefit of CDK. It simplifies the whole process of creating cloud formation scripts. So meanwhile, let's see how far it has gone through deployment process. I was asking you some, okay. So I uh, have a video of how this process went through, just, just to, for the benefit of time. Let me. So this is the process I showed you just now. Uh, let me see if I can. So this is, you've seen these things. And as you can see, this is how it goes ahead and creates all the green grass resources for you. The roles, it creates the roles for you, creates the metadata, it creates the functions, lambda functions, uh, the lambda aliases. And as I move forward, all of these resources, the IoT thing, the policy, and it uh, attaches the thing to your principles and all that. So once all of this created, uh, let's see, I want to show you the stack. This is the, the cloud formation stack. It completed the creation of the stack. And I want to show the resources as well. So it's created all these resources, the green grass core, the functions, the group, the policy, policy attachment, all of that. So. Um, yeah, the two tools 
device tester helps you automate the test suite, make sure that your devices are ready for um, green grass. And uh, CDK helps you automate the deployment of the process and expedites your overall deployment in a large scale implementation. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Kathleen again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, so what have we seen so far from outside energy, right? We saw from Russ how they used uh, out-of-the-box native capabilities. We saw from Neil's demo uh, how actually to use tools to help you provision at scale and manage your devices at scale. And the IoT device tester can be very useful if you have a piece of hardware you don't know if the green grass runs on or can run on. You can actually run the device tester to figure out if it's something that it's worthwhile for you to spend your time with. But the key takeaways are that um, every time you scale up any implementation, you need to have a process to continuously monitor the incoming data. So the third pillar in, in our perspective on how to deal with large-scale IoT implementations takes into account the data ingestion. Uh, we've seen at Woodside Energy how Russ and his team managed to ingest the data scale. And I'm going to actually provide you with two paths, two avenues for you to consider when ingesting data at scale. The first one is actually, uh, you know, ingesting the data uh, via queuing or buffering. There are two different ways in which you can ingest the data at scale, the IoT data at scale. And in this case, uh, for data buffering, we're going to use Kinesis. Woodside Energy uses Kinesis. We have Lambda as a consumer. And uh, the, the main idea is that you put the burden of data ingestion on the IoT core in Kinesis. So you don't have to provision anything in particular. You can actually very easily, straight out of the box, make this architecture work within days. Uh, the, the data gets processed real time. If you think about this, uh, this Kinesis architecture, right, the stream-based architecture, what makes the stream-based architecture different than event-based architecture? And what makes it different is that you need to gain access to real-time data. Event-driven architecture, you may not need to get access to real-time data. So Kinesis uh, can actually help you create this multiplicity. You have multiple applications that can actually read the data at the same time. So if you have um, any other applications that you say, I want to send an alert right away, or I want to stop the conveyor belt, you need to actually make that logic either on premises, meaning on green grass, or you need to actually perhaps engage with your service teams to say, this thing you know, needs to be serviced in a period of time. So the key takeaway is that um, you, know, you, you can actually use the data buffering to help you ingest data. We talked about the, the stream-driven architecture. The second component, actually, the second avenue uh, through which you can actually ingest data at scale, right? It's actually using, uh, using data uh, queuing in this case. So in this case, what I do is I'm going to ingest the data, and I have a safe way to persist the data to enable multiple applications behind the scene to take advantage of it. Uh, I showed you the ideal architecture uh, for the conveyor belt uh, monitoring. That one uses a queuing mechanism because I want to pass the data on to uh, Elastic Beanstalk via DynamoDB in order to present the data to the operators. So the, the good thing about this is that uh, it handles the data spikes seamlessly, right? Because every single component behind this architecture scales up for you. And you can also allow downstream services to scale, right? So if I have an elastic beanstalk that all of a sudden I have a lot of usage on, then I can uh, provide for time for that to, to, to scale up. And if you get throttled, you can also hold on to the data. So you'll not lose the data. The data persistence in a queuing mechanism is going to be your friend. Also, one piece to keep in mind, and, and Russ alluded to that, is the cost. Always, when you deploy at scale, you have to take a second look at the cost. Because what works in small scale may actually not work from a cost perspective at large scale. So every time you have an opportunity to do cost optimization of your architecture, do that. But the basic tenets stay the same. Use native services, then use automation tools, 
and then take care of the data ingestion at scale. Those three components have to be there. And the foreshadow, if you think about it, should be the cost optimization. How do I deal with that? And it's something that um, I hear and we, I see a lot, we see a lot, uh, is that you know, I, a developer can come to the table and say, we can do that. But then when you do the math, they, that may not be the best solution from a cost perspective. From a technology perspective, it might be, but you have to tweak the architecture to account for that. So if you think about the event-driven architecture, right, um, and now you have, you have a, a mechanism to queue the data and actually engage with different downstream applications to allow you to have a truly event-driven architecture generated uh, by the data from your IoT devices. So here is the summary of what we talked about today, right? Uh, one piece, a critical piece for the automation, for the scalability of your IoT, industrial IoT application use all the tools in the toolbox. Uh, you know, we saw the device tester, we saw the cloud formation, we saw the CDK. Those are elements that you have to put on the table to make sure that you manage the, your implementation at scale. The second piece is actually, how do I actually build uh, data ingestion at scale? I showed you two sort of basic approaches. One of them is buffering, one of them is queuing. Know the difference between the two. And, and make sure you think about cost when choosing one, uh, not just the capabilities. And then um, you need to introduce monitoring of your assets early on. Keep that in mind. Many, many industrial IT implementations will actually focus on, on uh, the data that the devices send, but you need to troubleshoot the devices. You need to be able to monitor the devices themselves. Make sure you account for that. And the native services, we saw the IoT events, AWS IoT events, uh, used by Woodside Energy to create a state machine in the cloud. Uh, we, we also have uh, more industrial uh, capable products like AWS IoT SiteWise, as well as a, a third paradigm for ingesting data using AWS IoT analytics. And with this, uh, the session is over. I would like you to take a moment to uh, take, if you want to learn more about uh, AWS IoT um, services, please have a look at the training site uh, highlighted on this slide. Uh, you can actually go and some of the classes you can take for free. You can learn a lot about, uh, about uh, the basic and more advanced elements of the AWS uh, IoT ecosystem. And uh, please uh, complete the session survey when you get a chance. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, we'll be here uh, until um, for about eight more minutes, so don't, don't be shy. You can either ask the questions at the microphone or stop by to ask us any questions. Thank you.